born in, in a little place called Erskine. Okay. West of Stettler, nine miles west of Stettler. Moved to the homestead in, in the 1930s into the bush around Winfield and Hoadley. The first year on the homestead, they had a, my oldest sister and my father built a log house, waded snow up to their bums to uh, cut the logs. When we moved onto the homestead house, there was no gable ends, and the mosquitoes came in one end and took a load and went out the back end. Um, fast forward, I attended a little school in the um, bush by the name of Society School. A grade 11, moved to a little hamlet called Hoadley. Um, at the age of 15, went to work on the railroad on an extra gang. Uh, seven years there, and then I joined forestry uh, May the 25th of 1956 in Lac La Biche. Uh, first posting was 12 hours later on the railroad from Lac La Biche to Chard. And that's where I was posted with forestry first. Uh, quickly, moving from Chard, um, about um, June, first part of July in 1956, moved to Anzac and helped build Algar Forestry Tower to a 50-foot le level. The road from Anzac to Algar Tower at that particular time was a, uh, a trail bulldozed through the bush, uh, all kinds of muskeg, all kinds of uh, experiences on the road. Flowing out of Algar Tower site in about in the end of September 1956 to go to school in Kananaskis with the forestry. Came back to McMurray in, in December the 13th of 1956 uh, to be in charge of the forestry uh, ranger district. Uh, I was met at, I'm going to add to some there, the, uh, I was met at the train station by a fellow by the name of Joe Lawrence. It was a very cold night at waterways. The wind was blowing down the track. He stuck out his hand and he said, it's colder than the mother-in-law's kiss in here tonight. And he said, welcome to uh, McMurray and waterways. You've got to remember that the population of these two places in the wintertime is 1,200, but 400 of them are sleigh dogs. Fast forward again, met my first wife in McMurray, uh, transferred to Wandering River in 1958, transferred from Wandering River to Lac La Biche in 1968, 1973, transferred back up to Fort McMurray, 1979, uh, I moved to a place called Cold Creek, which is west of Edmonton, and the ranger station was right behind the No Jack Hotel. I lost my first wife in 1985 to breast cancer, uh, but oop, I got ahead of myself. I moved to Edmonton in 1980. Uh, to take a, a, a job in the Forest Land Use Branch and was the Forest Land Use Coordinator for the province of Alberta for six years. Then I got tired of the bureaucratic you-know-what and I decided to retire. So in 1986 I retired. After 30 years with the Forest Service, I met, well, because my present wife was my first wife's auntie by marriage. We knew each other. She had lost her husband uh, in 1980, so we got together. There was an old uncle up here at still time at that time that also I helped with until he had to go to Fort McMurray. That is how I come to Fort Chip. And I got involved with various programs here in the community. Number one was I, I helped coordinate or was the chairperson of the committee that drew up the first uh, tourism recreation plan for Fort Chippewan. 
uh, was work, uh, worked with the ro uh, Weather Road Committee, um, worked with the Housing Committee, um, guarded at the cop shop for a few years, um, but m the main part of my time was spent here in this building. And I've been here ever since. People say that the history of Canada is boring. Absolutely not. Mm. Not when you think that the Denny people have relations in the Four Corners area of the United States, and they're called the Navajo and the Apache. They also have relations in Northern California, and I believe they're called the Hopi. And I was told, I can't prove it because there's nothing in this building to, to uh, confirm it in writing, that there is a group of people in Northern Colombia, South America, that speak pure Denny. And as I said, I can't prove it. Just recently, there was a, a skeleton of a 15 or 16 year old girl found in one of the caves in Mexico. Uh, she uh, dated 13,000 years. And she has a very distinct relationship with the first peoples that populated North America. Um, in other words, coming across on the land bridge. Um, and the Denny uh, people here, I, I call them the people of the Athapascan linguistic group because there's so many. There's the Chippewine, the Beaver, the Slavey, the Dog Rib, the the uh, yellow knives, uh, the Gwich'in, uh, subgroup, uh, the hare and the Lushu. It goes into Yukon, down into BC, and the last two groups of people in BC are uh, the Carrier and the Sakani. But they're all part of that linguistic group. Uh, they also have relations in the Four Corners area of United, of, pardon me, they also have relations west of Calgary and they're called the Sarah Sea. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, the history of the area uh, over and above the, uh, the fur trade mm -hmm. is amazing, absolutely amazing. And of course, um, Hudson Bay sat on Hudson Bay for a hundred years and never had a, an outpost until 1778. And uh, Samuel Heron, after he came back from the Copper Mine River, um, built Cumberland House. In the meantime, the French fur traders had been working in towards the west. And then there was an upstart company formed in Montreal, and it was called the, the Northwest Company. And they f gradually overcame and took the uh, for, uh, the French fur traders under their wing. And the first white trader in this particular area was a man from the Northwest Company by the name of Peter Pond. He came from, from uh, Connecticut and he had experience in the Mississippi, Missouri uh, watershed fur trading. He also was a, an ex-soldier. He had a small group of men. He was associated with the Northwest he came to Cumberland House uh, <coughs> Fort Carlton, Isle Cross, Laloche, the first white man to use the the uh, Mathay Portage, down to where McMurray is today, and then down to uh, the Ember, down the Athabasca River. Uh, which is about 30 to 40 miles upstream from the present location. I think that took place this last treaty days, where the three groups, the Denny, the Cree, and the Métis, 
got together and put on their treaty days as a group mm -hmm. rather than separate they get unified mind you there is a few more b new buildings and this type of thing mm -hmm. some improvements some uh, <laughs> Some I don't think are improvements, but that's my opinion. Right. I happened to be in McMurray the day that they, the group from Fort Chip plowed the road through, and we were at the, at the hotel that's right close to the post office. The Alberta government had sworn up and down that there was no way they could get a winter road into Fort Chip. And so Michael Cardinal, who is now involved with Lakeshore Helicopters and his construction company, Emil Girard and a few more, John uh, Mike Chatty get, put some money in. They took a cat and they bowled the roast road to Fort Chip, mm. or to Fort McMurray. Yeah. They, uh, and of course, after that, then the government took over and st started to improve a bit. Yeah. What was it like? Yeah. Well, it was a bulldoze trail through the snow, across, he went up the Embra, crossed um, a couple of lakes over there, and over across the Richardson Lake, and then wound around. And it was bumpy and uh, narrow. Uh, you couldn't have a, a lead foot on it. <laughs> And then the corners were sharp. You never knew what, who was coming around the other corner. So it was, it was, uh, it was quite a trip. And they... But com compare it to today's winter road. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the winter road today is like a hard top highway. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, it was uh, uh, Michael Cardinal that located the road where it is today, too, along with Emil Gerard and, and these people that worked on it. But, yeah, the road in comparison is between a wagon trail and a highway. And that's basically what it was. Just for information, the road from Bitchamont to Old Fort Point was pushed through in the winter of 1956, spring of 1957. And that was the first road that came in. And it was called a road to resources. Mm -hmm. And they, the main idea behind it was because they, the government had already figured out that they were not going to mark the river anymore for the barges. So they attempted to push a road through to Old Fort to use big, uh, tired dune buggies type of vehicles to haul freight so to, uh, to the shore, uh, lake south shore and then transport from there to, into Uranium City and those type of places. Mm -hmm. However, of course, as time went on, Uranium City went down. They built the Mackenzie Road uh, Highway they built the road, uh, the railroad, on the west side of the province. So all the freight started going that way, and that, but that was the original. That was the original road. Yeah. Hmm. And how I know that is because the expediter for the road crew stayed with me in the forestry cabin that was located at the Legion Manor. You know where that is? You know where the uh, Golden Age Society House, yeah. yeah, that used to be Army Signals. Oh. And straight across Fraser, there's a, a senior's home there. Yeah. That was forestry. And we had a little forestry cabin there and shops and whatnot. And that's where we stayed. We had a, a stopover cabin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was stationed at Wandering River in 1963, the first, the day that the first survey stake was driven for Highway 63. Wow. In 63. The 
it used to take us, my scout car, which is a track vehicle, almost a full day to go 25 miles north of Wandering River because of the muskeg and whatnot. And now you can do it, and well, depending on how heavy your foot is. <laughs> Well, when I first came up here, it was a, a viable fishing uh, operation going on. But you know what's happened since, you know, because of the uh, because of the oil sands and this and the chemicals that are used. Um, I understand. I was just told today that that the game branch is going to shut down commercial fishing all across the province, and of course this. Uh, this was news to me, and it's absolutely new. You know, maybe I shouldn't have repeated it, but they uh, it's gradually there was there's plenty of fish in the in the lake, but and I still eat the fish, and there's other people in the community eat the fish, but there's certain parts we don't eat because it will accumulate uh, cancer-causing uh, problems, but. Uh, uh, if you want to go out and go fishing, get your permit and away you go. Well, it was seasonal, you know, spring and fall, and it was the local people that did it, and they had a market for it, and now the market's gone, you know, but it was a form of employment, and gradually as the plants uh, became operational, there was more and more job opportunities for the people here. Well, you know that, but you know, it's it's common across the region. The uh, I uh, had only wished, and I know it was like jumping off the end of a pier, but I only wished that when Suncor or GCUS had been planned that people would have carried out lots of baseline studies. And of course, there was nothing. And the reason for that was because it was a, a political expediency and the, uh, the money for the province and also the jobs. But nobody thought about what was happening otherwise. I've had some amusing, <laughs> well, in the set from 73 to 79 when I was in McMurray as a land use officer, we worked on the Suncor dikes. And the first big tailing pond, of course it was all sand. So we experimenting and we planted, I don't know how many thousand, deciduous saplings. And then there was a chappie from Edmonton, my Department of Agriculture said, maybe we should plant, you should plant creeping red fescue. And that's a grass. So we, we planted cre creeping red fescue. It grew like a son of a gun. But it did also something else. When the snow came in the wintertime, it held the snow off the ground about six, seven inches. We went back into the spring to do uh, studies on the trees to see how they survived, and every one of our trees were dead. It, they'd been ringed by the mice under the snow. That creeping red fescue made a perfect breeding habitat for the mice. So the next step that was taken was they hired a mouser <laughs> to trap mice to recommend putting up a perches for uh, hawks and owls to sit on to get to mice and put out brush piles to it, <laughs> to, uh, for the uh, ground type like the weasels and the mink and this type of thing. Uh, you know, we had quite a chuckle out of that. <laughs> we te teased him unmercifully and asked him how much he was getting per hide. <laughs>
Well, there used to be float planes all over the place. We have a picture on the wall over there of uh, Milt McDougall, who, uh, that pit particular picture, he's on skis, but he used to fly, and the Norsemen up here with mail, and they'd land in front of Moss Cafe, you know, for the mail, and they would land there in the wintertime. Uh, there's a, I'm going to uh, promote the book that Marge McDougall wrote. It's called Tar on the Floats. And it talks about Marge, um, uh, McDougal, Milt McDougall and Marge McDougall uh, and their experience in Fort McMurray at the tail end of the, of the Bush pilot era and right up until uh, the, he passed away. It's a very interesting book because there's all kinds of stories in there that would be of great interest. A, <laughs> a young forest officer from Chard uh, in the summer of 56 uh, was called to take a firefighting crew to a place called 210 Creek south of Cheecham. They had a fire. So we, I gathered up seven men, went to the siding, onto the train, and went up to, to uh, 210 Creek. We got there and the first, and you've got to remember that I was totally green. I hadn't worked with Aboriginal people before, but <laughs> for the first morning breakfast, those men ate ten eggs apiece. So I asked old Wink Plews, the forest officer who was in charge, I said, how come? Oh, and he said, you've got to remember, Oliver, this is the first fire of the year and they haven't got their fill yet. <laughs> Consequently, there was a crew who came in from Lac La Biche. It rained. Of course, that put the fire down a bit. So then the big move was that we were going to all move back to, to uh, me to Chard and, and the other crew to Lac La Biche. And the darn train jumped the track. So we were stuck between Cheecham and two, well, we were at 210 Creek. The train jumped the track uh, south of Cheecham, so we were stuck. We, so we went fishing in, <laughs> in 210 Creek. Well, the first night after the rainstorm, we were there was myself, a young uh, assistant ranger by the name of Dave Clegg, and Lawrence Whitford, and Wink Plews so were sitting in the cabin, and the, everybody was talking. But usually, you have a granite cup of a granite pot of tea to, to liquefy your throat cords. So I said to Wink, I said, who's going to make the tea? And he looked at me and he said, you're the youngest in the crowd. You do it. I said, okay. So I took the pound of tea and I said, how much tea do you put into one of these pots? Because I'd never made tea. <laughs> And he said, you just keep shaking and we'll tell you when to stop. So I go shook and shook and shook. In the meantime, Lawrence and, and Witten got into a, a very deep conversation and I kept shaking tea. <laughs> 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 he find, I said, don't you think after the half a pound of this tea had disappeared, <laughs> I said, don't you think you've got strong enough tea? Oh, oh you forgot. <laughs> so I put the tea away, brewed the tea. And I poured Lawrence Whitford the first cup. And he took a drink out of the cup and he went this way. It was so thick he could chew it. <laughs> Many little funny incidences, but I really appreciated those two old men. They were great people and they both lived in Anzac. You, you got to remember too, you know, that the early people that were here, uh, 
my first father-in-law and his cousin could put on the snowshoes in the morning with the dog team, and when they'd finished that night, they'd gone 40 miles. And uh, people here remember running dogs and traveling great distances, you know. They were in very good shape and whatnot, as long as they had the dogs. But the, And now all you hear about is diabetes and <laughs> all the negative stuff. How well, there's there's less. less of it. There's less of it. There's people that still go hunting and trapping and right. and fishing, but they you know they fish for making dry fish uh, for their own use and maybe a little bit to sell to or, get, or give to a neighbor. Right. The same thing with the hunting. It's not to the scale it was before. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the trapping people. There's a few trappers that go out, but it's just like going out for a hobby type of thing. Mm -hmm. There is a bit of fur, but it's, uh, it's definitely changed. And I, I think it's going to continue to change. Mm -hmm. uh, I know people here would like to see young people being taught traditional knowledge and whatnot and, and taken back to the land. And I hope they're successful because it, there is a tremendous amount of information out there in the plants and whatnot that have been tra traditionally used, mm -hmm. and I use some of it myself. But you know, it's uh, it went from a period of high use mm -hmm. and gradually gone to yeah. a very low use because of the problems that have arisen. Eh? Right. Well, it'll depend on the how they can get it back. Mm -hmm. It'll depend on who teaches them. Right. You know, if it's the elders, mm -hmm. they they may uh, take up the traditions. Right. But let's face it, with the jobs and whatnot. Exactly. You know. Yeah, it's all getting lost. And all the boats and the vehicles and skidoos and this type of thing. I know. We miss those simple pleasures now. Yeah, it's not as simple as what it used to be. Because people can come in here and see the, the results of the labor of the... Exactly. You know, the results of their activity and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And we have a library there that has contains, yeah. <laughs> contains many uh, uh, books on uh, traditional history and, and this type of thing, so... If they want to take advantage of it, there's the chairs, the couch, mm -hmm. and they can. T I can't. Let, we can't lend them out because it's. It doesn't come. They don't come back. Of you know. That, oh, yeah. I. I hope it certainly does. Mm -hmm. At least they get to know. Their history. We have a genealogy program here. Oh. That, and we have the records from the. Uh, the Anglican Church from uh, 1874, and we have uh, early records of the Catholic Church of people who were born and raised and and who they're related to and this type of thing here in the community. Mm -hmm. And of course, with the there's always been the, the two main churches, Anglican and Catholic. And uh, there is also the community church, or, and they're affiliated with the uh, 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 Prince Albert, a native ministry. Oh. Yeah. And, but, and, and the congregations vary with the side of. <laughs> you get the C and E crowd, but. <laughs> but they, yeah. Come and visit. Uh, get to know why it's called the oldest community in Alberta. Now, here before Edmond, Calgary, Victoria, and Vancouver even thought of. Uh, get to know the history of Alberta. That's the big thing. Get to know the people, meet the people, and take advantage of 
being able to go up the lake with my boat and bring the young people in to mix and so they can play their um, baseball, hockey, stuff like this. It's a, it's a remote, remote community and it's very different because there is no all-weather road and I'm not sure whether the general population would ever accept a winter road or all-weather road because uh, although the drugs and the alcohol are here, uh, they're afraid it could get worse. Yeah.